sleep with a gremlin on their chest staring down on them. It's, an even, it's even a type of painting that has these gremlins on women's chest. Now, some people today say that, well, we don't believe in gremlins anymore, but some people do believe in aliens. And perhaps, just perhaps, there's a link between people who think they've been abducted and people who wake up in the morning feeling paralyzed. Well, I don't know. It's just a theory that's been proposed out there that perhaps sleep paralysis can explain all sorts of dreamlike states that people have, a feeling of fear, a feeling of somebody bearing down on them, a feeling of somebody doing experiments on their body. Who knows for sure? But there seems to be a link between dreams and aliens. Alan Weiss. Becker, Montauk, New York, your description of dark matter sounds a bit like the old theory of the ether, which was found not to exist. Why are you so sure that dark matter exists? Dark matter, which is invisible matter, makes up 23% of the known universe. In fact, our galaxy would fly apart without dark matter. If you take a look at the Milky Way galaxy, it spins too fast. According to Newton, it should fly apart. It spins 10 times too fast. So what holds the galaxy together? How come the Earth is not being flung into outer space? How come we're still in the galaxy? It's because we're surrounded by a halo of dark matter. Now we have maps of dark matter. The Hubble Space Telescope and other telescopes can look at light that bends as it goes through this invisible matter, like light going through glass. Glass will also bend light. And we now have maps of dark matter. So dark matter started off as being science fiction, almost ghost-like, but now it's firmly in the very heart of science itself. The only thing we don't know about dark matter is, what is it? We don't know what dark matter is. You would win a Nobel Prize if you could figure out what dark matter is. It is just this totally unknown quantity. Greg in Louisville, good afternoon to you. Hello, Dr. Taku. I enjoy your work on the Science Channel and other places. Two quick questions. One, what do you think of the uh, concept of the singularity as advanced by Ray Kurzweil, Singularity University, the genetics, nanotechnology, and robotics advances that they're anticipating? And also, how can I find out more about your radio show? We, I don't know if we get it here. Well, first go to my website, mkaku.org, M-K-A-K-U.org. I'm in 130 cities around the country. It's a weekly science show. I interview two top scientists a week. Can so you, you listen can online? Uh, yeah, you can even listen online. That's right. And okay. it's a talk show. You can even call in. If you have questions, you can call into the show. We have a hotline number and record the question, and I'll try, try to answer it. Now, about the singularity. Because machines are getting smarter and smarter, then the question is what happens if they exceed us in intelligence, and what happens if they have children? And the children of these machines are even smarter than their parents, and they have kids. And all of a sudden, you have this explosion of intelligent machines, and we humans are left in the dust. Well, first of all, you have to realize where we are today. Our most intelligent robots have the intelligence of a cockroach, a mentally challenged cockroach, a lobotomized, uh, slow-learning mentally challenged cockroach. That's how smart our machines are today. They take about five or six hours to simply walk across the room by recognizing objects around them, very slow. However, we can project that one day they'll be as smart as mice. They'll be able to scurry around, <coughs> hide, look for food, and then maybe as smart as a dog or a cat, then maybe as smart as a monkey. At that point, they could become dangerous. I suspect that at that point, we will put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they get that smart. So as we approach the time, <coughs> as we approach the time when machines become very smart, I think we should take an extra bit of effort to put a chip in their brain to shut them off. And we'll get uh, Dr. Kaku a sip of water. Bend, Oregon. Kay, hi. Hi there. What a privilege to get to ask you a question. Um, <coughs> I have two questions, actually. The first one is inspired by Quantum Healing by Dr. Deepak Chopra. He explained that um, electrons have an orbit, and that <coughs> the orbit it changes when healing happens, and that the leap that happens between one orbit and the other orbit is the definition of a quantum leap, and that in the human body, when 
a cell replicates itself, it can choose to either replicate itself as it finds itself, damaged or sick or whatever state it's in, or it can go back to the original blueprint in its DNA. So, Kay, what's your question? The question is that um, as they were looking at so-called medical miracles and unexplained healing, um, they could see that 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 had happened, that the orbit of the electrons had changed. If you were going to um, apply something to a human being to inspire that quantum leap that happens in healing, to inspire the cells to go back to the original blueprint of the DNA and replicate themselves as a healthy cell, what would be your top best guesses of what to apply to the human body? Thank you, Kay. Okay, well, first of all, the electrons do go in shells around the nucleus, and they do jump. These are called quantum leaps, and when they jump, <clears throat> they emit light. So some of the light in this room, the light that floods our world, is due to jumps inside these orbits. And when these atoms bump into other atoms and form DNA, they share the electron. That's what holds DNA together. Why do DNA molecules hold together? to give us chromosomes and cells. <coughs> it's because electrons do share each other as they leap around different atoms. It creates almost a dance, and that's what holds, that's what holds the molecule together. Now, healing, on the other hand, is much more complicated, and however, it's possible that mental states can affect healing because mental states affect the immune system. The immune system, in turn, is our first line of defense when it comes to disease. And so that is very definitely influenced by thinking, because thinking affects our immune system. Our thinking affects the stress hormones that circulate in our body. But, well, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an authority on quantum healing. But it turns out that electrons, as they jump in their orbits around atoms, as they share, as they share each other, as they go around the DNA molecule, is the basis for life itself. Our guest, if you would like to reach him, as he mentioned, you can find it at mkaku.org. That's his website. You can listen to his radio program online. At that site, you can contact him. You can buy his books at that site. You can follow him on Twitter or Facebook as well. We have just about 10 minutes left with our guest on In Depth this month, Austin, Texas. Robin, hi. Hi. Uh, yes, you've jumped around the subject all morning and um, or afternoon. I was thinking, I was wondering what you thought about if uh, people have created their own aliens with stealth stalking machines, which have landed on all government and institutional lawns, who com whose competitive jealousy and greed finds en enemies of self ambition, passion, and love to be regulated. In hey, Robin, where's all this coming from? preference of aligning the stars in their favor of the middleman profit and government control of one's own existence? Do you think that uh, that that's gotten ahead, uh, like technology has gotten ahead of, of people's rights? Uh, Anything you want I to respond to? I don't quite know what the question is, uh, but let me try to just say a few comments. Uh, it is true that technology races so fast that morality, politics, democracy has, has to catch up in the sense that our brains have not really changed much in 100,000 years. We still have the caveman impulses, the personality of cavemen and women 100,000 years ago, except we have nuclear weapons. Uh, we do have biotechnology and chemical warfare technology. So we have to be able to restrain some of our primitive impulses, and I think the way to do this is democracy. A democracy means educating people, informing people about things, and I think that with education, democracy is enforced so that people can democratically make the decisions to control the, the fantastic power of science. So science by itself is a sword. There are two sides to science. We hope that the democratic side will exercise informed informed control over this technology. Now also you mentioned conspiracies and stuff. Some people think that maybe our technology is so rapidly advancing that it must have come from an alien civilization in outer space. Well, I know this technology. I've been following it year by year. I interview the people who created much of this technology. And they say, no, it wasn't God-given. It wasn't given us to an alien. Every year, somebody had to struggle 
painfully struggled to create the first transistors, the first integrated circuits, the first microchips. It didn't all of a sudden fall into our laps because we discovered a flying saucer then that gave us all this technology. It was year by year, decade by decade, painfully put together by the scientists and engineers who made it possible. However, these scientists and engineers do not have access to the media. No one interviews them when they make such a discovery. And so when these discoveries hit the marketplace, people are amazed. They say, I didn't know that. How come this could happen so quickly? It didn't happen so quickly, but it seems to appear that way, and that's why some people believe in government conspiracies and maybe that this is alien technology from outer space. I don't think so. Dr. Kaku, if it, you were to recommend one book of yours for people to read, which would that be? Well, two books I think I would recommend. One is Hyperspace, if you're curious about, um, you're curious about the fundamental structure of nature itself. And then I think visions, if you're curious about the future, that is computers, medicine, biotechnology, nanotechnology, where the future is carrying us. Because these are the twin passions of my life. On one hand, I want to work on the theories of Einstein, understand the secrets of the universe. But on the other hand, I want to know the future. I want to have a sneak preview by interviewing the finest minds who are building the future in their laboratory. So visions and hyperspace are the mm -hmm. two that you'd recommend of all of them. Jim Pittsburgh, hi. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Kaku, for the opportunity to address you with this question. Dr. Hugh Ross, an evangelical physicist and astronomer that I've followed over the last few years, believes that our species, Homo sapien, did not evolve from earlier species of bipedal primates, but instead was created by a supreme being or God at a unique point in time when our planet was just right as far as being habitable. In fact, he believes that many, if not all, species of animals were uniquely created by an omnipotent God and not through evolution. In other words, he doesn't believe in evolution per se. Does this viewpoint violate the laws of physics, or can a theory of ongoing creationism coexist with the current laws of physics? And if it cannot, can a theory of ongoing creationism perhaps coexist with a future law of physics to be discovered sometime in the future? Well, let me say just really quick what physics says about evolution. First of all, physics can date fossils. Physics can 